Okay, we're recording so that our people overseas and our people throughout the nation and other nations can hear this message. And what we do with the recording, we also put the recording on my YouTube channel, YouTube, Leroy Carter. And you can go back on YouTube and get all the messages that we've had even through the past year. And um, um, you can really build up a library of teaching solid basic foundational teachings about the Lord Jesus Christ and the Christian faith. So we praise God. We praise God. And um, I imagine that soon our school, our students in uh, Africa and Kenya and other places will make these YouTube, uh, YouTube teachings available in the school of ministry that we have in Kenya. They're already doing that in Jamaica. And so we just praise God. Back to basics ministries, ladies and gentlemen. We organized this ministry back in 1996. So it's it's got a 23-year a, a track record, and we organized it in Philadelphia. And I thank God for those who helped me to organize this ministry. And the Lord said, it's time for the church to go back to basics. God said that to me 23 years ago. It's time for the church to go back to mi- basics. God said the church is so far out there, out there in the deep stuff, out there in prosperity, out there in uh, uh, things that are not pleasing to God. And so the Lord said, I want you to organize a ministry to teach the people how to go back to basics. Bring the people back to me. Bring the people back to me. Teach basic things. And don't try to be deep. So, hey, ladies and gentlemen, I ain't deep. I ain't deep. Hey, Nathan, I ain't deep, young brother. I am not deep. There is nothing deep about Pastor Carter. I'm basic, and uh, we teach the basic things of the faith. And so God has blessed this ministry. He's blessed it so much that, uh, well, we're incorporated in the state of Pennsylvania, and now our school of ministry has produced uh, Bible students and taught Bible students in many nations, We've had several graduations here in the United States, and um, our our ministries are kind of like the model that Pastor Paul Begley uses for his school of prophecy. And so back to basics ministry, we're getting ready to graduate about 100 people in Jamaica in October. Uh, our, our teacher and pastor in Kenya says we have 75 people enrolled in three settings, three schools in Kenya, and so we're about to launch 4th in September. We're going to launch and expand this ministry to provide a bachelor's degree. Many people have received their associate degrees in, in many countries. Starting in September, we're going to advance this ministry to provide a bachelor's degree for anyone seeking a bachelor's degree. And uh, our our school, our costs are, we keep them low so that people can afford this school. And guess what? By summertime of this year, we will be fully accredited, ladies and gentlemen, as a uh, school, as as a, uh, a, uh, we're going to be fully accredited under the NATS, uh, National Association for, um, American Theological Schools will be fully accredited. We've gone through the three-year process of accreditation, and we praise God. Uh, We'll be fully accredited. Then next year, uh, the the Paul Baker School of Prophecy will be fully accredited. So tell people there are schools available and schools that they can go to at low cost. We keep the cost down, and people are blessed by what we teach them. They are blessed. Why are they blessed? Because the Holy Spirit is leading us. Okay, so we're going to get ready, and I want you to get ready for uh, a word today. And um, Dustina says, uh, Michael's out in the nasty storm, and st- rain and lightning and thunder there in Tennessee. So Lord, protect Michael, protect the people Keep a hedge around them. And, Lord, while we're praying, we're praying for Pastor Paul, Pastor Paul Begley's father, Pastor Charles Begley, in Knox, Indiana. He's in the hospital today. I ask that you heal him. 
Father, stretch forth your mighty hand, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Now we're going to ask our friend, Ryan Trogler, one of the wonderful students in our Paul Bakley School of Prophecy and an assistant to this ministry. Praise God. Uh, we're going to ask Ryan if he would come on at this time and prepare us to receive the word of God. Ryan, would you pray for us, please? Yes, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Pastor. Good morning, Church. Good morning. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for making another wonderful day. We want to thank you for waking us up to enjoy your day. And we want to thank you also for providing all of our needs, dying on the cross and shedding your blood for all of our sins. Uh, we also want to raise up Pastor Paul's father. Uh, please come down and heal him. <clears throat> um, we also want you to give the knowledge and wisdom to Pastor Carter to give us your awesome word today. And we just want to put the protection over, over Dustina's husband out in these storms and protect everybody from these storms. And Lord, we just want to thank you for everything that you have done in all of our lives. So we just want to say thank you, we love you, praise you, and glorify you. In Jesus Christ's precious name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. Praise God, Ryan is so faithful. And we thank God for you. Ryan, Ryan, uh drives an 18-wheeler. He drives a big rig. And Ryan is a testimony because when the Lord said, start this online church, make it available to people who cannot attend church, people who don't attend church, people who are sick and shut in. And Ryan, oftentimes, he's on the road uh, listening and participating in the online church while he's driving a big old rig up and down the highways. So it's a shout out to you, Ryan. And um, thank God for your leadership, for your family, and the great job you're doing in the Paul Bakley School of Prophecy. And we thank God for you. I kind of want to give a shout out to Zisla down in Midlothian, Texas. Praise God. We've got people from all over the nation with us today. Praise God. And so we've got a lot of people on their phones, and uh, we don't know who they are. But hopefully at the end of the service, you can come on and identify yourself. We even reach um, Kenya, and we reach Dubai. David Carter comes on regularly with us from Dubai. So this is an international ministry, and God is truly demonstrating to people all over the world that he's a God of love. He's no respecter of persons. He loves everybody. And so let's look at our message today, and uh, I want, uh, I believe this message will help you and strengthen you. Uh, many of you are teachers and ministers, and you go forth and teach others. So that's my purpose, to help train you and to, to help send you forth that you can be a blessing to others, and, and we give the glory and honor to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's all about Christ Jesus, ladies and gentlemen. It's all about giving him the glory. It's all about obeying him and taking the gospel to the nations. God wants everybody to hear the gospel and to be saved. The scripture says, how can they hear without a preacher? How can they preach unless they are sent? You may say, well, I'm not a preacher. Well, if you're sharing the word of God, if you're testifying, you're ministering the word of God to others, you are a preacher. Praise God. And the scripture also says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel, who bring good news. So you got pretty feet. You got pretty feet, Dustina. Nathan, you got pretty feet. You got pretty feet, Ryan. Praise God. Contrary to what uh, your, your wife may say, Ryan, you got pretty feet. Hallelujah. So praise God. Okay, the question is, what happened when Jesus died on the cross? And we're going to look at several things in answer to this question today. Several things. Praise God. And um, our scripture, we want to take a look at John chapter 19. John chapter 19. And verses 16 to 30, I'd like to read this scripture to you, John chapter 19, verses 16 to 30. 
Or if anybody there has your Bible and you'd like to read this, uh, turn to John 19 and verses 16 to 30. Dustina, do you have your Bible available? Dustina must still be having problems coming on. Okay, okay. Zisla, do you have your Bible available? No, I apologize, Pastor Carter. No, I'm driving. I apologize. Okay, you're driving. No, I don't want you reading while you're driving. Okay, okay. <laughs> thank you. God bless you. You drive safely. Okay, uh, I, will read, I will read John chapter 19, verses 16. John chapter 19, verses 16 to 30. Then delivered he him, therefore, unto them to be crucified. Meaning Pilate delivered Jesus unto the crowd to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth unto a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. Now, uh, John does not mention Simon of Cyrene, who carried the cross of Jesus. Another gospel writer mentions Simon of Cyrene. So each of the gospel tells a different version of the story, but they're still telling the story. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, on either side one, and Christ in the midst. So John gives us a, a description how Jesus carried his cross to a, a place, the place of the skull called Golgotha, and there he was crucified between two thieves who were also crucified. Verse 19, And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. That's what Pilate put on the cross, and he put it in three different languages. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. And it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. So Pilate put up a sign written in three languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Verse 21 then said the chief priest of the Jews to Pilate, Write not, don't write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. Then they said, therefore, among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, because that was an expensive coat. Whose it shall be? Let us cast, uh, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they parted my garment among them, for, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now, when you look at that verse, the soldiers are not saying that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith. The soldiers said this, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be. Then John adds, as an editor, he adds that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. So John adds that uh, the scripture, Psalm 22, 18, was fulfilled in the death of Christ. So when Jesus died on the cross, we find much scripture being fulfilled, much that the prophets had written and prophesied hundreds of years before, ladies and gentlemen, was fulfilled with the death of Jesus on the cross, even with his riding into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. That was fulfilling prophecy. How he rode in on a coat, on an ass, 
and the coat of an ass. Verse 25, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. So the three Marys were at the cross, at the foot of the cross. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by, whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Ladies and gentlemen, before Jesus gave up the ghost, before he died, he took care of his mama. He took care of his mama. He saw her standing at the foot of the cross with uh, his Aunt Mary and another Mary, Mary Magdalene, and Jesus took time from dying, and, and he took care of his mother. So you can add this to the list of things that happened when Jesus died. Scripture was fulfilled. Old Testament prophecy was fulfilled. Jesus took care of his mother. And next, next he's going to give responsibility to one of the disciples, the disciple John. He said, woman, behold thy son. So she gave her, his mother over to John. Jesus released his mother and gave her to John for safekeeping and for care. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. John got a new mother at the foot of the cross. And from that hour, John, that disciple, took her into his own home, and he cared for Mary. Jesus is love, ladies and gentlemen. He is love. He took care of business even on the cross. He TCB'd. He took care of business on the cross. After this, verse 28, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. I love this verse. Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. He said, I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. He knew that all the scripture was fulfilled. He knew that he had accomplished his purpose for the reason why God sent him into the world. He knew that he had accomplished. And then he says, I thirst. Now you may say, well, why did he say I thirst? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I thirst was also old prophecy scripture that he would thirst. And the next verse, now there was, a, there was set a vessel full of vinegar and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. That fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. Everything that happened on the cross, even before the cross and after the cross, was fulfillment of things that were spoken about Jesus even 800 years before he died on the cross. And there, verse 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Ladies and gentlemen, when you look at the seven last words or the seven last utterances on the cross, we see, uh, we see Jesus, uh, first of all, say, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Jesus forgave his murderers on the cross. And then he forgave, forgave those of us who would, who would condemn him. Uh, uh, and we walked in condemnation until we gave our hearts to Jesus and submitted to his lordship. And then uh, uh, Jesus even cried out when darkness covered the earth for three hours from 12 noon to 3 p.m. The earth turned to darkness. Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Ladies and gentlemen, for the first time in all of history, since even in the beginning, Jesus was separated from God the Father. Now we know that he lived on earth for 33 years, and he was separated from the physical presence of the Father, but Jesus had communion with the Father. The Holy Ghost was in him. He communed with the Father daily, many times uh, throughout the day, sometimes all day long, overnight. He communed with the Father. The Father spoke to him. He spoke to the Father he received visions from the Father. Jesus even said, I do not do anything unless I see my Father do it. But on that, in that three-hour period, on that Good Friday, we call it Good Friday, what was good about it? 
The good thing about it was that he gave his life for us so that we can have eternal life. He paid the price for all mankind, everybody, black, white, uh, Asian, uh, no matter who they are, big, uh, small, fat, skinny, tall, short. He gave his life for every one of us, ladies and gentlemen, so that we can have eternal life. That's love. That's love, ladies and gentlemen. That is love. Praise God. So Jesus said, it is finished. In other words, I accomplished my mission. I accomplished my mission. And praise God, praise God. Uh, uh, somebody made a cartoon many, many years later and, and, and had a cartoon character, uh, Popeye the Sailor Man. I, 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 I saw, I seed my duty and I do it. He said, Pop, I said, I seed my duty and I do it. But Jesus, long before that, said, it is finished. I know why you sent me here, Father. And on the cross, he cried out, it is finished. Woo, I have accomplished my purpose. Ladies and gentlemen, want to be wonderful. Want to be wonderful when we stand before the Almighty King, our Lord and Savior. And he says to us, Jeep Girl, when he says to you, uh, uh, Jackie Fisher, when he says to you, hey, Nathan, when God says to you, Ryan, Wes, everybody else, Eric Jackson, when the Lord says, uh, uh, thou hast done well, my good and faithful servant. You have done well. You have accomplished what I've sent you to do. Ladies and gentlemen, when we know that we know that we know that we have accomplished God's will, what a great feeling. That's the feeling. That's the experience I want to have, to know that I have pleased God. Even though I've spent many years as a sinner, I thank God for saving me, bringing me into this new life, this life in Christ. Thank you that uh, the scripture says for you and me, we are crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, we live, yet not us, but Christ lives in us. And the life that we live in the flesh, we live by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. So ladies and gentlemen, it does not matter what you did before you got saved. All things are passed away, the Bible says. All things are become new. And as Jesus bowed his head and said, it is finished, then he gave up the ghost. He gave up the ghost. You and I will reach a place in our lives as we continue to be faithful with, to the Lord, where the Lord will tell us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler of, over many things. And in the new earth, the new heaven and the new earth, the Lord will give us promotion. He will give us leader position, leadership position as he rules for a thousand years on the earth. He will give us leadership position, and we will reign with him forever and ever, ladies and gentlemen. So be faithful to what God has called you to do right now. Be faithful. Don't try to do what somebody else is called to do. Do what God has called you you to do hallelujah praise god hallelujah thank you jesus and we thank god thank you lord so we just bless god and praise god read uh for yourself john 19 verses 16 to 30 it's uh john's uh version of the the crucifixion of jesus and we're looking today at what happened when Jesus died on the cross, already we see that his death on the cross fulfilled many scriptures. Already uh, we see that Jesus' death on the cross has done many things for us. Jesus' uh, death on the cross gave his mother a new son and gave John the responsibility of taking care of uh, not only John's mother, Mary, but now his aunt Mary became uh, 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 John's responsibility to take care of her. And so we see many, many things happening um, when Jesus died on the cross. 2,000 years ago, an event occurred shocking to the sensibilities. An innocent man, an innocent man, ladies and gentlemen, 
allowed himself to be put to death. The only innocent person ever to walk the face of the earth. You may say, well, I beg to differ with you, Pastor. Uh, babies are born innocent. And I'll say, I beg to differ with you back. I'm not afraid to differ with you back, but I don't waste time differing. You know, there are so many people. I mean, they're denouncing pastors and preachers. I had a lady come online yesterday. It was so pitiful, the mean stuff she said. But I thank God that one of our own members of the Back to Basics online church, one of our own students from the Paul Begley <coughs> School of Prophecy, got with that sister and, 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 and gave her some love, some tough love, and told her, you, you, don't even, you don't know what you're doing accusing Pastor Carter of these things because you don't even follow back the basic ministries. You don't even listen to his messages. And all that you're doing is making accusations. I mean, I thank God for that, sister, uh, for standing up against that woman. And I have no bitterness towards anyone who's ever accused me or those who are, uh, you know, a lady called me a false prophet. You know, they got under my skin, man. She called me a false prophet. She has no clue of this labor of love for Jesus. No clue at all. And so be careful. I want to say this to every one of you. Be careful how you condemn preachers or prophets or apostles or teachers, even fellow members of the body of Christ. You don't know what their life is all about. You don't know what God's hand is doing in their lives. Before you condemn somebody, you better know what you're talking about because you know what? It, it, there's a danger even talking about another uh, member of the body of Christ. The scripture says, uh, 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 touch not my anointed. Do my prophet no harm. So that ought to make every one of us repent. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hand of an angry God. And if you've touched one of his anointed, somebody he's anointed, might be a Bible study teacher, might be an intercessor, might be a prayer warrior, might be someone feeding the hungry. And if you condemn that person, or you put a bad mouth on them or label them, you have touched the anointed of God, and you're doing God's prophet harm, and you have committed sin. So be careful. Be quick to repent. And ladies and gentlemen, let us walk in love. Let, oh, uh, let, when you're a leader, when you're out here on Facebook and YouTube, and you're uh, uh, leading a ministry, yes, you're going to be shot down by a lot of people. They're going to hate on you, but you can't return hate. You can't fight with hate, ladies and gentlemen. We've got to fight in love. For though we war in the flesh, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And so when people condemn you, when they accuse you, when they, uh, and it's actually Satan using them, even Christians, Satan uses Christians to denounce other Christians and cause confusion. And we've got to walk in, in, in holiness and in righteousness. And we've got, we take some of the hits. We take the hits. We take the persecution. But you still respond in love. So that's, that's something we all need to do, respond in love. Pray for those pastors, those leaders, those out there. I mean, some are getting hit every day. Boom, boom. Every side, every side. They have no more cheeks to turn. They're getting hit. Boom, boom, boom. And many of you are going to get hit, but respond in love. I'm saying all this because I believe the Holy Spirit had me to say this. And, and your response is, don't hate anybody. Don't even seek vengeance on anybody. Uh, vengeance is mine, the Lord said. I will repay. And I praise God that one of our own students stood up and, and, and boldly faced down that person and let the person know, hey, girl, you don't even know what you're talking about. You need to get with the program. And so, and, and when the girl gets with it, when she gets with the program, we're going to love her up, praise God, and keep on ministering to her. Hallelujah. So what else happened when Jesus died on the cross? And we're going to look at, answer this question and many other questions. Another question is, what was the motivation? Jesus' motivation for dying on the cross, I mean, I mean, nobody wants to die. And nobody wants to die for another. Romans, in the book of Romans, talks, talks about us. Scarcely would we give our lives for a friend. I mean, we've got some good friends. We've got some homies, some roadies, some old, old drinking buddies. 
uh, folks we smoked reefer with 20 years ago and, and, and shared the whole same wine bottle with, uh, but you ain't going to die for them. And we got people in the church, uh, praise God, we pray for them all in that. We pray for them. We hold their hands when they're going through. Uh, we ain't going to die for them, ladies and gentlemen, because we don't want to die for anybody. But Jesus, as innocent as he was, he who was without sin became sin for all of us. He was born to die for the whole world. Ladies and gentlemen, that was his purpose. That was his purpose. He was born to die. God looked around and, 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 and he, he said, I, I'm looking for an intercessor. I'm looking for someone to stand in the gap before me for the land, meaning the whole world. And I found none. And then God determined he would bring righteousness, bring deliverance, his own self. And that and God, we're talking about the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, said, I will go, Father. You prepare me a body, and I will go and live among them without sin, and I will pay the price that justice demands. And Jesus, I mean the second person of the Godhead, the very God, God the Son, said, I will go. I will leave heaven. I will leave heaven. I will go and give my life for them. And as wicked as mankind is, ladies and gentlemen, we haven't even seen the tip of the iceberg of wickedness in this world. It's going to get worse and worse. And Jesus, seeing all of these things and knowing the heart of mankind, Jesus volunteered to go and die for all mankind. And only Jesus could do it. God required someone who was without sin. He could not choose Moses. He could not choose Abraham. He could not choose anyone else because all were born of flesh. All were born of, of the sinful seed of, of a man. And uh, because Adam uh, refused to obey God, Adam uh, uh, believed the serpent rather than God, Adam gave up the right to eternal life. And Adam changed, listen to this, Adam changed the DNA of all mankind. Adam allowed sin to come and, and disrupt the DNA of all mankind. God created Adam pure and righteous and holy and gave him a, a helpmate made out of Adam's rib. And mankind was pure and holy and had the lordship of the whole earth. Mankind was created without sin, but yet Adam believed uh, his wife. His wife believed the serpent, and Adam was, was responsible for the fall, not his wife. Adam was responsible for the fall because he was responsible for his household. And Adam gave up holiness and righteousness and even gave up the purity of his DNA. And when Adam sinned, the nature of mankind changed, ladies and gentlemen, that mankind became a sinner and that all persons, even as innocent as that little baby, even as innocent as that little baby looks, that baby is born in sin. That baby was shaped in iniquity. And that baby needs to be saved and delivered. That's why when you sprinkle babies at the age of eight days old, and call them Christians, that is incorrect. No, that child must be born again. That child must know who Jesus is and why Jesus did die. And that child must uh, receive Jesus as his or her own uh, Savior and confess Jesus and renounce sin and repent and turn from it. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why you must be born again. You must be born again. Jesus came all the way from heaven and died on the cross so that we can have eternal life. The motivation was love. The motivation was love. Why did he hang for us? Why did he take that humiliation? Why did he let them beat him all night long? Why did he let them beat him until his flesh hung from his body? Why did he shed his own precious blood? Why did he let them uh, spit on him, urinate on him, defecate on him? Why? 
because of love for you and me. Ladies and gentlemen, God loves us so much that he allowed his only son to die for us, and yet we have people in, in our households. We have people in our families. They are too, bless God, lazy to go to church. They are so stuck on themselves, they won't even worship God. Ladies and gentlemen, we're living in a nation where 80% of our nation won't even take time out on a Sunday for one hour to go to church and worship God. We have, we're living in a nation where 80% of people have turned their back on God. That is a shame, ladies and gentlemen, when you think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he did. Jesus died. What was the motivation? He loved us. He knew we were all sinners and that uh, unless he died for us, then there would be no way for us to be reconciled to God. What was the purpose? The purpose was that we could be reconciled to God, that we, mankind, who had been separated from God through sin and through shame and through guilt and through disobedience, that we could be reconciled to God, that God would receive us as though we had never sinned. And ladies and gentlemen, when when you give your life to Jesus and receive him as your Savior and Lord, you receive him and God receives you as though you have never sinned. What is our response? We need to respond to God in fear and trembling. I mean, there are not too many people going to church these days with fear and trembling. They walk in church, chest all puffed up, head all big and blown out of proportion, uh, uh, and they will say anything that comes to them. They'll say anything to the preacher. They will say anything to others. They look down on, on others. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to go back to the cross, ladies and gentlemen. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I'm happy all the day. And when you go back to the cross, and, 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 and many people listening need to go to the cross. There are people listening today. You have never been to the cross. You have joined church. You, you started going to church. You started attending church. You started following some TV evangelist or some prophet. You, you uh, uh, joined that person's movement. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not joining some prophet's movement or some church movement. It's not joining church. church. You must be born again. You've got to be born into the church. And the only way to be born in the church is to confess your sins, ask God to forgive you, and then ask Jesus Christ to come into your life and be your Savior and your Lord, and then commit yourself to him. To believe in Jesus means you're going to commit yourself to him. You're going to commit yourself to the Bible. You're going to commit yourself to the Word of God. We've got a whole lot of nominal Christians out there. Yes, they have lip, lipped their, uh, gave Jesus, Jesus some lip service. They have confessed with their mouth, but they have not committed their heart to Jesus. That's why people will condemn pastors. That's why they have put their finger at you. That's, that's why they will call you a name that your mama did not name you. That's why they will uh, uh, rob you. That's why they will uh, cheat you. That's why they will hate on you because they have made lip service to God, but they have not committed their heart to God. You must be born again. And if you want to be born again, you can be born again. God is waiting for people to be born again. Well, Pastor Carl, I've been a member of the church for 35 years, and uh, uh, I'm comfortable with where I am. Ladies and gentlemen, please do not be comfortable where you are if you have never given your heart to Jesus, if you have not asked him to be your Savior, if you know that you know that you know that you're, you're still a homosexual, if you know that you know that you know that you're still a lesbian, if you know that you know that you know that you're still hating people, if you know that you know that you know that you're a racist, you hate black people, you hate Hispanics, you hate whites, you hate Africans, if you know that you know that you know that you've got bitterness towards somebody, you need to be born again. I'm talking to, yes, I'm talking to the choir. I'm talking to the church. You must be born again. The Bible says that if I regard iniquity in my heart, he won't even hear me. The Lord will not even hear me if I know 
I have iniquity in my heart. Well, let's move on because there are a few things I want to give you. Another thing that happened when Jesus died on the cross, listen to this. According to Matthew 27, 25, according to Matthew 27 and 25, listen to the word of God, which says, Then answered all the people and said, His blood be upon us and on our children. No, that's incorrect. Darkness came all over the land. Darkness came all over the land. I'll find the right scripture, but right now uh, I don't have that. I have an incorrect scripture. Uh, darkness, when Jesus died on the cross, the whole world became dark. Ladies and gentlemen, the whole world, from sea to shining sea, Across the oceans, the whole world became dark for three hours. That was a miracle because darkness came over the world, which resembled that darkness had, had killed. The powers of darkness had put Jesus to death, that the powers of darkness thought they had, they had won the battle, that they thought they had won the war. The whole earth became dark. And this was a very real picture of both physical and spiritual darkness that occurs without belief in Christ. Even Mother Nature gave her testimony. Even Mother Nature gave her testimony when Christ died. Uh, listen to this. Uh, the earth shook and the rocks split. The earth shook and the rocks split. Look at uh, Matthew 27, 51. And behold, let's go back to 50, 50 and 51. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top up to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Ladies and gentlemen, these are some other things that happened when Jesus gave up the ghost. The veil in the temple, that's a curtain, 60 feet long from top to bottom, 60 feet long, and four inches thick, ladies and gentlemen. That veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, that veil that prevented the high priest from going in to the, the, uh, the tab into the, the uh, testimony, the Ark of the Covenant, except for once a year, that veil split from top to bottom, ladies and gentlemen, which are, are symbolized. No longer is there any curtain, any separation between God and mankind. Now, because of the death of Jesus on the cross, everybody has the right and the ability and the opportunity to come into the presence of God and be saved and be received by God as a member of the body of Christ. The Bible says also that the earth shook and the rocks split. There was an earthquake, ladies and gentlemen. An earthquake uh, took place. A powerful earthquake took place. Now, that scripture that I wanted to give you was 27, 20, 45, about darkness covering the earth. From Now, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for helping me to find the correct scripture. There was darkness over the whole earth. More things happened when Jesus died on the cross. We'll bring this to a close in a moment. Graves opened up, ladies and gentlemen. Graves opened up. And the dead saints, not the dead ain'ts, the dead saints, they rose from the dead. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and and uh, Moses and, and those saints who had gone on uh, before the time of Jesus, their graves opened up, ladies and gentlemen, and those people were found walking on the earth, walking in Jerusalem. Ladies and gentlemen, when Jesus died on the cross, the graves of the saints opened up, and that whole weekend people saw they were able to greet Moses on the street, Elijah, Elisha, Abraham, and so many others, ladies and gentlemen. 
Can you imagine what this looked like? The dead arose when Jesus died. God brought to life what was dead to fulfill his purposes. Again, he reminds us that the final victory of Christ conquered death. He is over all. He reigns victorious over sin and death. And then later on, when, when uh, and we see this uh, uh, just two days later, three days, three days later, when Jesus arose from the dead, victory, all power in his hand, death could not hold him. Death, death could not even keep Jesus. The grave could not even hold him. That's how powerful Jesus is. And ladies and gentlemen, death won't be able to hold you and keep you. Death is a temporary transition that we go through as we transition from this life into eternal life. That's for us who are saved, who believe. But for those who are not saved, death is a doorway to eternal death and destruction, the lake of fire. So the choice is yours. The choice is everyone hearing this word. The choice is yours. You've got to choose Jesus. You can't choose him by joining the church. You can't choose him by giving your money to the preacher. You can't choose him by joining a movement. You must be born again. The only way to be born again is by the Holy Spirit. It's a spiritual birth. It's a rebirth, ladies and gentlemen, that you and I must go through, and it happens when we confess our sins and turn from them, and we ask Jesus Christ seriously, invite him into our lives, and commit the rest of our life to living for him. That's what the new birth is all about. And ladies and gentlemen, it means once you commit your life to Jesus, you're going to commit your life to him forever. You're not going to change next week when somebody uh, uh, throws feces in your face. You're not going to quit following Jesus when your bank account runs low. You're not going to stop following Jesus when you lose your job. You're not going to stop following Jesus when your wife walks out on you. No, it's a total commitment. For the rest of your life, ladies and gentlemen, and here, and this is the thing that that really troubles me about so-called Christians in this nation. If you're really born again, how can you hate somebody because their skin is different? If you truly love the Lord Jesus, how you can hate? How can you hate somebody because their political persuasion is different from yours? How can you truly love Jesus if you want to keep people? certain people out to, to to preserve your own kind. How can you truly love Jesus when you look down your nose upon your neighbor because of your neighbor's skin color or your neighbor's uh, job or your neighbor's children? Ladies and gentlemen, God is love. If you're truly born again, they will know you're a Christian by your love. Well, you might say, well, wow, I come short in so many areas. Yes, and so do I. And so the bottom line is that we need to repent. We need to repent and ask God to save us. Salvation is a continuous action. Once saved, not always saved. If you find that you have drifted, you've got to ask God to forgive you. You've got to ask God to cleanse you. Salvation is a continuous experience. Salvation, uh, to be saved, is, is written in the Greek language in the aorist tense. It means it keeps on happening. You can't turn from God 10 years from now and expect to be in heaven. That is why, and the Lord told me this uh, this past week. God said, I, I don't want you to go on Facebook and say to people, happy heavenly birthday. Now, I know this might offend some of you, but God told me, this is for Leroy. He said, I don't want you going on Facebook uh, saying to someone, happy heavenly birthday. God said, I don't, I don't care if it's your mother, your father, or anyone else. Don't be saying happy heavenly birthday. He said, because you don't have a heaven to put them in. And you don't know whether or not these people are in heaven or not. Everybody who's had a church funeral will not wind up in heaven, ladies and gentlemen. Everybody who had a preacher say some kind words over them is not going to wind up in heaven. So God said, no, 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 no. You don't know where they are. 
just wish him happy birthday. <laughs> hey, hey, Dustin, I'm going to take God's word at that. I'm going to wish him happy birthday. So there are many miraculous things that happened when Jesus died on the cross. Darkness came all over the land. The temple, the veil of the temple was writ, was torn in two. The earth, there was a great earthquake. The rocks split. Graves opened up. The dead saints walked the earth. Lives were changed. Many people began to realize that he was the Son of God, even the soldiers and many around the cross, when they saw that darkness come upon the earth and darkness stayed there for three hours, they said, surely, surely, he must be the Son of God. It did not take a rocket scientist, ladies and gentlemen, to see earthquakes and, 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 and storms all around you and darkness and, and, and all this. It should not take a rocket scientist to know that this one that they put to death on the cross was the Son of God. But then God put the icing on the cake. He put the icing on the cake on Easter Sunday morning. On Easter Sunday morning, when up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph in his voice. He arose and said, victory is mine, victory is mine. And then when he met with his disciples, he, is, he said, behold, I was dead, but I'm now alive. Behold, I give you the keys to the kingdom. Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. I'm so glad to be born again. I'm so glad that you're saved. I'm so glad that we're in the body of Christ. I'm so glad that we have power. I'm so glad that we don't have to live in gloom and doom. I'm so glad that we don't have to stay depressed. I'm so glad, hallelujah, that we are not condemned, but we are saved by the blood of Jesus. I'm so glad that the Lord loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. I want you to take a little bit of time right now. We're almost finished right where you are. You may have been going to church for 40 years. Your mama may have built the church. Your daddy may have been the first pastor. You may be a preacher's kid. You may, be, you may have been raised up in a godly household. But yet, you all need to be born again. I want to ask you, are you born again? Have you been born again? Can someone see Christ in you? Has your life truly changed? Or let me ask you this. Are you still struggling with relationships with people? You still hating on people? You still hating on people because they're a Republican or a Democrat? You still... Uh, allowing yourself to be susceptible to the lies of these corrupt and deceptive politicians? Or you, do you become upset when someone talks to you about Jesus? Do you read your scripture and, and apply it to your life? Have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? These are things you need to ask yourself. Do you love your neighbor as you love yourself? These are things we need to ask ourselves. Do you have Christ in you, the hope of glory? And let me ask you this. If you should die tonight or this afternoon or in the next moment, will you go to heaven? If you should die today, will you go to heaven? This is a question you cannot run from. No, no, you can't. You can't drink it away. You can't smoke reefer and make the question leave you. The question will stay with you. You can be born again. And to be born again, ask the Lord Jesus. Say, God, I'm sorry for my sin. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe he died on the cross for me and took away my sin. I believe he was raised from the dead on the third day. I want Jesus to come into my life and receive him by faith, ladies and gentlemen, and then commit yourself to studying the Word of God. You're a new creation, so learn what you're to do as a new creation. And then unite with a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church. If you don't have one, then stick with us on Sundays until God shows you a brick-and-mortar church where you can go and stand and grow and help others. This is Pastor Leroy Carter. It's been a joy 
a privilege and an honor to minister the word of God. Thank God. Thank God. Word did this come to stop. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for us, for, for providing eternal life. We bless you and honor you. Bless the people in every land where they're listening. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.